Um, first and foremost, um, so good to see everyone here. Um, and I think a big round of applause for Lufthansa because uh, Lufthansa has been doing this program for the past three years. And the best part about this program is not just for the TV show. TV show, there are multiple TV shows which happen, but they always ensure that you know, before the show there is a mentoring program which is uh, uh, done, which basically benefits a lot more people than people who actually go and appear on the show and the viewers of the uh, show. Uh, as part of the program, uh, I'm here to share some uh, experiences. And before we start, uh, we will have a video which uh, will play and we will get that done soon. How many of you are already an entrepreneur who have already started? Great. Almost 70%. Uh, how many of you have started less than a year ago? How many of you have less than two years? And how many of you less than five years? Great. So we have a mix of people who have started between zero to five years. That's a great audience because whatever I would talk about, most of you would be able to relate to. Uh, what we try and do is to keep the Gyan low, keep it more interactive, and we'll keep it uh, as much of practical as we can. Big business idea deserves to be on the biggest SME stage. Lufthansa Long Way to Success is back with season three. Let the best business minds help you at Long Way to Success membership camps. Our experience of Lufthansa Long Way to Success was an amazing. Every bit of advice that we received about Lufthansa Long Way to Success coming up was from people who have been there, done that, know what works and what does, it was simply invaluable. Mark these days in March for the mentorship camps, which will take place all across the country. It's your chance to learn success mantras directly from the gurus and be on the TV series for a chance to win a Thai mentorship and a ticket to Stanford University's Design Thinking Bootcamp. Lufthansa Runway to Success Season 3. Register for free. Coming soon. Only on ET now. So we talk about key ingredients of startup success. Um, first, foremost, disclaimer. There is no mantra, there is no formula. Uh, there is no guru who can take you to Nirvana. Everyone has to do their own stuff. What works for me, in all likelihood, is not going to work for you. Whatever has worked for the person sitting beside you is would be very different from what is going to work for you know you. However, what we certainly can do is to share experiences. These experiences that we share need not have to come from people who have so-called been there, done that. It could actually come from each of you as well. Because every one of you have learned something since the time that you started. And that learning has its own value. Most important thing that we need to do is to ensure that we keep our mind open to new learning. Because the only way to succeed is doing things which has not been done before. Because if we simply go ahead and repeat, and if it was so simple that we repeat, everyone would go ahead and repeat, right? We know Flipkart. Why don't we go and create another Flipkart? It doesn't work that way, right? Uh, a lot of people are trying to create Lufthansa as well. They haven't really been as successful as Lufthansa is, isn't it? So, most importantly, I think uh, what we really do is to keep our minds open 
to learning not only today going forward all along and so what do we talk about today so there are two clear cut paths that you have to take when you start your business you got to figure it out how big you want to make it everyone wants to make it big but the fact is not every business can be big you got to accept that fact and if you're talking about high growth large business is a different route that you take to a very small business that you run for yourself there also a term which is used lifestyle business unfortunately it's a very abused term which is why i don't like to use that uh, term but basically it means that you know you run a small business be happy with the profits that you earn you are not necessarily chasing the top line all the time right you're not really chasing the large market all the time it's just a choice that you have to make right in the very beginning right because if you don't make that choice in the very beginning and you think you are going to build a very large business but you what you essentially started cannot become large enough you will be frustrated so it's not a great idea right so might as well make a choice and you say great i think for next 10 years i just want to enjoy my life relax a bit i will run a business which gives me sufficient money great i want to run a business which uh, build a business which my child could take over and soon run it great however what we will talk about today is the high growth model of business so what we are going to talk about is key ingredients we are not going to talk about recipe we are only going to talk about ingredients any dish that you prepare i am sure everyone here can prepare some dish or the other right maggi to kabhi banai sakte ho na i can tell you for sure that even for maggi where the taste maker is given if two of you prepare parallelly the taste would be different right it's the most standardized ingredient that you can get is a sachet of maggi a packet of maggi however no two people would be able to make exactly the same kind of maggi which will taste exactly the same despite the fact that there's something called taste because it's given isn't it that's exactly what startup is even if someone gave everything to you all the formula all the recipe your start is going to be different from someone as a start hence what i want to talk about today is key ingredients i'll try and get into detail and share some of my learnings about each of these key ingredients and then possibly talk about your learnings around each of these areas as well so here are the things that we are going to talk about today we will talk about opportunity what really is a large market opportunity when we talk about large businesses what is a large business right how do you know it's a large business uh, we will talk about team everyone says team is the most important thing what really is a high quality team how do you define a high quality uh, team what i according to me is the most important part of the this ingredient is most important ingredient is your unique insight about the market that you are going to be talking about your ability to build highly differentiated product your agility to experiment iterate that product and you figure it out what is right your aptitude of trying to figure it out how you market the product your shameless capability to go out and sell and we we'll talk about another thing which is talked a lot about on entrepreneurship is perseverance right i would like to call it a realistic perseverance why we will discuss that uh, as well so we'll take each of these we'll typically spend 5 to 7 minutes on each of these slides while i will talk about what my learnings are i would also want to understand what your learnings are because that's what will make this experience much richer than whatever i have learned 
law. So how do I define a large opportunity? Right? Everyone says that we am chasing a large market, but what really is a large market? How do you define a large market? How do you define a large opportunity? The most important part that we have to look at is who the customer is. And for that customer, what problem am I solving? If it is not a problem, what aspiration am I fulfilling? Is that problem large enough? Is that customer segment large enough? And that is what gives me a large opportunity. What is the, the most common mistake that each one of us have made at some point in time in our life? Is that we have come up with an idea. Believe me, that's the worst thing which can happen to you. To come up with an idea, hey, I want to build this. I have done that myself, which is why I can tell you for sure. This, hey, I want to build this, is the killer. Because you build that without even trying to figure it out whether someone actually wants you to build it or not. Is someone really looking forward to that? I know all about the Steve Jobs theory, right? Don't go and ask the customer what he wants, right? I take it. I know about the Henry Ford model, what he said, right? But if I went and asked people what do you want, they would have said a faster horse carriage, right? But please understand. They are visionaries, they were visionaries, I am not, and I accept it. Hence, I would rather go and understand what customer wants, and then possibly add my own insights to that. When I talk to 10 different customers, 20 different customers, I extrapolate and I understand what they want. Whatever else, Apple did, but the fact is that if iPod had come 20 years earlier, it wouldn't really have succeeded. For iPod to succeed, a Walkman had to come in, an MP3 player had to come in, people had to experience whatever else was there for someone to actually bring out a product which was really, really superior product. Right? So when we actually start looking at things in isolation or in awe, we miss the bigger context in which they exist. Mac came in, original Macintosh, it didn't really do well in the market. For a Macintosh to work and to be successful in the market, a shitty PC had to come in, which people had to experience to be able to know what exactly Macintosh means. Right? Everyone had to experience some form of so-called smartphone to understand what iPhone feels like. So you always need a context. So the most important part of identifying a market is how do you get and solve a problem for a customer who is underserved customer. The best market to chase is underserved market, not unserved market. In an unserved market, there are no reference points. It's the most difficult market to actually go and sell because you create a market for something which a customer does not understand. So all the examples which I gave, right? Look at the car itself. It was an underserved market because people were riding horse carriages, so they had something to look up to which is so different, which is so faster, which does not require a horse. Right? It was an underserved market, an iPod was an underserved market, a Macintosh went into an underserved market. So the most important part is trying to understand what is the problem that the person has today with the solutions which are available today, those solutions not necessarily be competing products, it just could be an alternative. Right? 
So if I sell a phone today, I must understand what problems people have with the existing set of phones which they have before I can actually go and say, hey, I'm going to come up with a great phone. What is that great phone? How do I define that great phone? So understanding what and how a customer is underserved is the most important part of understanding the market. Then you look at whether there are many customers like them who are underserved. I am not saying you cannot do a good one-serve market, just that it's much more difficult to do it, right? The second part of this is that why it would be underserved? But does the person know that it is underserved? That there is an alternative? Would the person be open to that alternative? I might be underserved, but I may not even know that I am underserved. Which is what happens when you have been underserved for a long period of time. If you have been traveling in trains which never had AC, right? which never had cushions on the uh, berth, you would think this is how it works. I mean, how can I have an AC in the train? How can I have a cushion on the berth? It's very difficult for an average traveler. So those of you who have seen those days of non-AC train without cushion, uncushioned berth would understand and appreciate when the cushions came in, it was a big deal. When the AC came in, it was almost like a miracle that okay, you can have AC. <coughs> Most of the people didn't have AC in their homes when the AC came in the train. That was an underserved market. What is the reference point? Right? On this count, can any one of you volunteer to talk about your business? And how you think you're serving an underserved market? I'm sure some of you are talking about it. So uh, we are building an electronic check that is issued from the mobile phone. Uh, it's uh, and it's deposited from the mobile phone and it's sent by email. Uh, the currently there are the, the several options of paying someone in a business environment is uh, to do an RTGS NEFT or to write a check. So we compare ourselves to the physical check where the paper check has to be written manually, sent by post, and deposited uh, uh, by going with the branch. So we are serving this market which is underserved in the sense that it's uh, the current market. The current product is cumbersome and very expensive um, and manual. And our solution is, is electronic, electronic, electrifying that and offering an electronic alternative. Anyone else would want to talk about an underserved market? You might not talk about this, right? We are also providing beauty and wellness services to women at home. And uh, the market of freelancers uh, has been there from that in my time frame. Uh, people used to get services at home. So um, when I started this business uh, three years back, I realized there was no organized company as such who is actually into providing beauty, professional beauty and wellness services at home. In fact, I myself was struggling when I was working with uh, banks and uh, freelancers were petite, they were unprofessional. So that's how I feel my business is serving unserved customers. Underserved. Underserved uh, customers. So just to give examples, right? Uh, I'm just taking these two pieces, people who was, they volunteer to, anyone who wants to volunteer, please talk about your business. By the way, this is a good opportunity to talk about your business quickly, right? Please. Uh, hi, I'm Sharad. And uh, first, I'd like to thank you for putting this perspective into my head. So uh, the the fact that, uh, you know, underserved and unserved, the way it suits my business, I'm a dweller from Chennai. So uh, uh, if you go and ask any dweller across the country, they'd say that 
South Indians are the worst buyers because they don't have a taste and they only look at you know how much dowry goes in how many order. how many South Indians here? Please take offense to it. Makes it more simple the answer. So, and as you said, I've been doing research for the past one year only because uh, I was a mechanical engineer, totally new in this field and all of that. So, uh, uh, the interesting perspective here is right now I'm doing, I'm learning the different kinds of uh, jewelry designs that prevail in the uh, history of the world and all of that. So, taking this to Chennai, I would first experiment with Chennai because it's more cosmopolitan than any other city there. So, taking this, I really feel would be like taking something to the un underserved market because they already know what jewelry is all about and, and of course the economy is growing and Chennai is growing and more people want to experiment with the excess money they have. So I think this is a good idea. Okay. So I take these three examples now, right? If there were no physical checks and if you had started off with electronic payments right on day one, let's assume if it would be. And if you came up with a concept of physical check, very difficult to explain what a check is because I don't know what a check is and how can you tell me it's an electronic check, right? So it is underserved to that extent. I'm not talking about the business merits, but I'm just talking straight to this point about underserved and unserved, right? However, the fact also is that if I am used to a physical check, I would come and think of that it could actually be an electronic check. Right? Someone else has to come and think of and educate me about it as to how I am underserved. So it's not necessary, which is why I said that you know, if you are underserved, it's not necessary that you know that you are underserved. But when someone tells you, you would think, oh yes, I think yeah, it's a great idea, I think I would try it. Right? So if you talk about what you are trying to build to your potential customer and a potential customer gets it like this, you don't have to write a pitch, give a you know 30 minute yarn on this. The person gets into one sentence. It's a sign that the customer is underserved and can relate to what you are offering. If the person takes a lot of time, either your pitch is wrong or you are in unserved market. So the example that she gave about her business. You are used to getting some people, either you go to a professional salon and uh, for whatever, okay, whatever that you, you go to the <laughs> salon for, uh, or you call someone home. There's a clear difference. When you go to a professional salon, you get one kind of standard service that you get when you call someone home, you possibly don't get that, right? So as soon as you say that I'm giving you the same feel, treatment, experience that you would get at a, and service that you would get at a professional salon, I'm getting, getting you at home, people would say, oh, yes, I get it, right? We'll talk about <laughs> more aspects of this as we go along because all of none of this actually is in isolation. So we'll talk about uh, this as well. So which is why it's extremely important to choose your set of customers and the problems which they have. I'm sure all of you know about the concept of a medicine, right? That you may have a medicine for headache or you may have a vitamin tablet. So there are times when I don't have a headache so obviously I can't go and take a, I won't go and buy a medicine unless I have a headache, right? I won't buy a crocin unless I have a headache. So how does the vitamin sell? The vitamin sells because it is good for you. The person has to be educated, right? That's the aspiration part of it. So it's not necessary that people have the problem that you're solving. Many of you would be in businesses which are not solving a problem. Problem as in a conventional sense. Unfortunately, fortunately, aspiration, if you look at it, also a problem. Right? But that's for later discussion. So aspirational businesses, where you're providing services, products which are aspirational, there also you would have underserved 
customer. Right? But the way you talk about it has to be different because there the difficulty is most of the time the demand is very latent. It's not pronounced. Possibly you have to pitch it differently for a person to understand. Right? But aspirational is, you know, products and services which actually serve aspirational demands are typically pretty high in order in terms of margins that you do. The ones which solve a problem tend to be lower margin because problem is pronounced. You would have multiple competitors coming in there, driving the prices down and hence the margin down. Aspirational, not many people take a stab at that. Chance of failure is much higher in uh, aspirational products. Margins are higher, risk is higher, margin is higher. It's, I think it's a typical uh, game, right? Any one of you who you think are in this underserved aspirations product or service? Please. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we are into gluten free uh, baked snacks. So gluten free, uh, not too many people are aware well of it. So nowadays, most nutritionists and dietitians and even doctors uh, suggest. So if you're looking for a snack kind of thing or uh, gluten free free flour, so like bajra atta, etc., are gluten free. But uh, people, I would call it aspirational because if you are going in to buy a snack like a high priced baked snack, then it comes. Not everyone would do. So we do. Perfect example of an aspiration led product. Not that you shouldn't be eating gluten free product. But the way we know that okay, we will live even if we don't eat gluten free products. Right? And there's no benchmark which is suggest that okay, if you had eaten only gluten free product, you would have lived 10 years longer. Unfortunately, after we die, we don't see how long you would have lived. Right? You're saying something. So our uh, venture is basically non-hotel states. So like uh, non-hotel states, okay. like bungalows, villas, farmhouses, B and B's home stays mm -hmm. now. Uh, <coughs> and largely more to promote weekend meetings, so that you go frequently rather than mm -hmm. just going once in a while. Mm -hmm. So uh, and and then you get a lot of privacy. So we've got luxury bungalow, we've got flavors, you know, camping and things like that. So probably that is where we encourage people that you go out frequently. Yes. And, and so so it's low cost, high cost growth. But now we are increasing to come out frequently. So now I would also want to point out that I said earlier that aspirations businesses, why it's not a typical problem the way you define it, right? But it is also a problem. Why? Because someone out there has been prescribed by a doctor to have gluten free food, right? For him actually it's a problem. While for everyone else, it's aspirational. For that person, it's a problem, right? For a person who wants to go for a weekend break, right, but doesn't find a good property, for him, it's a problem. What needs to be done, and we'll talk about this when we talk about marketing, is to have messaging which makes that more pronounced, right? So that you tell people in so many words that you are underserved and why are you underserved? You are an idiot, you don't know you are underserved. My product is the best thing which has happened in this world. Of course you can't say that, but anyway. Now let's go to the next most important part. And that is high quality thing. I'm sure everyone in the world would have, would have told you that team is the most important thing. If you ever go to a VC, you would hear that. We fund the team. All good shit, but it's okay. Uh, no one fund the team. High quality team. What does high quality team really mean? Again, my experiences, please act on these experiences. Because I'm sure you might have experiences which are different or in relation to this. Or even completely opposite of this. So please feel free. First foremost, complementary capabilities. 
two friends, two ex colleagues, both coming from exceptional marketing background, being a co founder, bad idea. One person has to build, other person has to sell. That's the best deal. Someone must know how to build, someone must know how to sell. And I'm talking about build in a larger sense and sell in a larger sense. Right? And I'm not saying you should have only two people immediately. But it has to be complementary strength. And you have to be ruthless about it. Because when you come into building a business, you come into at least 10 to 15 years of your life. You can't build with a team, which is incomplete team, which means you are always dependent on an outsider and everyone else except for the co-founder is an outsider on day one. On day five, day ten, different story. But on day one, everyone else is an outsider. You've got to hire that person, you've got to sell to that person. Right? Bad idea to start with a team which is incomplete. Not really professional, but not only professional, but even life goals have to be common. As in, if one co founder wants a good, nice, cushy life, lots of money in the bank, being able to go on weekend holidays, being able to take their kids to Switzerland vacation every summers. And the other guy says, forget it, I'm just focused on building business. Bad idea. Sure shot breakup is gonna happen soon enough. Running your own business is a tough part, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't have that life goal. If you have that life goal, please both of you have the same life goal. You will not give over the other guy for sure, right? You will build a business in which both of you could take possibly, you know, one month off. Both of you could go, you know, one guy goes on one week, another guy goes on another week. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying you shouldn't have that. But you can't have two different kinds of life goals. Shared vision. Now this is professional. One guy trying to say, hey, I want to build a very highly profitable business. Other guy says, I want to build a top line growing business, thin margin, I'm fine with it. It won't work, right? If one co-founder says, I'm going to build a global business of vacation homes, right? The other co-founder says, I'm going to build India's best vacation home. They are two different vision statements. Being the best global does not mean you're the best of India. Please understand. Right? So it's extremely important to have shared vision. Both of you believe in that same vision. You may completely differ on base to go about it. And you must. If two co founders think exactly like each other, bad idea. If you don't fight, Extremely bad idea. Because then you again are dependent on someone else to bring newer ideas, someone else to bring contrary views. Bad idea. You must fight. But for the same reasons. You may have two different routes, two different suggestions, two different ways of doing things, but you must have the same shared vision. And which is what brings to the third point, which is about implicit trust. Because when I fight with you, no, this is not the way to do it. Doesn't mean I'm telling you you're an idiot. No. I'm not saying that I know it best. No. So that trust has to be there for two people to fight because then that fight is not personal. It's purely about which route to take. I have to go from here to Pune. Should I take NH? Should I take Expressway? You can fight about it. That doesn't mean that, oh, you don't want to go to Pune, you want to go to Goa. I knew it. I always knew you had a dealer model. You didn't want to go to Pune, you wanted to go to Goa, which is why I wanted to take a 
diversion from Alibaba. You know? <coughs> so that's extremely important to have that implicit trust that if this guy is saying something, he does not have to come and explain it to me why I am saying so. That I have the best interest in my life. I keep repeating a hundred times. Not a great idea. Right? Comfortable being naked to each other. Not a filter sense, of course. Right? And why do we say so? Because it's a tough journey, right? Everyone has their own insecurities, fears, personal problems, professional problems. Unless I have this comfort and I can share that with each other without being judged, I would make for a good performer. The team is not a great team. It's like being in marriage. You can't hide things and still <coughs> stay in marriage. Doesn't work, has never worked, it will never work. Same thing here. Team has to be reaction oriented. You could keep talking, doesn't really work. And which is what leads to the last point. So when you talk about you have to do it. It's not about, I will direct others to do it. They have to have that capability of rolling up the screen, dirtying their hands, and actually getting out and getting things done. Doing it themselves, no one is ready to do that. So I know a friend, he was running a, uh, he's running a startup, successful one at that. Uh, that. Went through a bad time because his seat your left, this guy, even though he's an engineer, whatever came from a coding background, he spent three months learning how to code. And today he does it better than what whoever he would have hired. Obviously, he didn't have the uh, whole lot of money to hire the best talent in the world. Right? He didn't give up. He learned how to code. It just took him three months. He may not be the best coder in the world, but still built it. So that ability to roll up sleeves and do it is extremely important and it has to be there with the founding team. Not just one guy will come and give all the white board gyan, another guy calling it hard, it doesn't work that way. If you are complimentary, if you, one guy is here to build, other guy is here to sell, the other guy should be able to actually go out on the street and sell, another guy should actually be able to Build it, whatever business. Yes. That capability has to be there. I'm not saying all the time you have to sell, all the time you have to build. You will, of course, have team and everything. But it cannot be just talk, no action. Any examples that you might want to bring about your own successes or failures of finding things? Yeah, I would like to talk about the shared vision part. Yeah. So we were three of us and uh, yeah, this is about the uh, shared vision. So we were three of us. Two of us wanted to uh, build a world class software company and uh, it might take 25 years or 30 years or be the next generation. And one of us wanted to make his uh, first uh, 5 million in the first 3 or 5 years and get out. So it was not a good team, we never worked together because the daily decision that was required in terms of hiring good quality people, uh, customer trust, were completely different because the vision was completely different that we had to break away uh, in, in less than six months. Case in point here. Great. Anyone else would want to share? You could share your good story as well. You know, you break up stories. story. Love story is also good. Except that. Uh, mine is a story of uh, struggling to find a co-founder because the word team is given a lot of emphasis. Uh -huh. So I started about two weeks back, so I'm fairly new to this journey, but over the last six, eight months I've met a lot of people who could be potential co-founders. But uh, there is a very clear case of people not having the same psychology that your friends have to be people who think alike. So that's why partnering up with friends is wrong because I have a lot of friends who have the same skill set. 
And uh, one of the things that you mentioned here is ability to take the, the lows and uh, partnering up with family might put that in jeopardy. So I've realized that uh, if you take friends and family out, it's very hard to find somebody who you don't know and you don't have a shared value system with. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge, but I just thought that uh, I'm better off not partnering up with somebody that I feel, don't feel 100% comfortable with. Completely agree. You might as well go alone. Not a great idea, but go alone than partner with the wrong person. You know, it's like recently someone was telling me, a friend of mine, still single friend of mine, he was telling me that I would rather stay single than break up every two years. Yeah. Uh, so along with the implicit trust, there's also a part uh, which is about respect. Because uh, you have to, you know, uh, you know, then a decision comes which you, you are not totally in line with it. Or you feel uh, something about it. You still respect that decision and you go ahead with that. So that's, it's, you know, you have to respect the other person's decision as well. As Brilliant it is. point. Brilliant point. So when you actually go and fight, right, at the end of it, once the fight is over, the decision that you take, it may not be your decision, your idea that you put forth, but it is still <coughs> the idea that you are taking forward. And after the fight is over, it's a common idea. It's, you can't go back and say, hey, you know what, I told you so, this you don't take it, you didn't listen to me. If you do that, finish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I uh, would like to share my specific experience. Uh, see, uh, basically, uh, we are, uh, you know, from an offline, my wife had set up a business. I was in a separate business altogether. She was a professional and she set up a business. The very fact that I was engaged in some other kind of a business, so I just, you know, and we were, I was attending a lot of conferences, high quality team, you know, uh, so thought I didn't have that, uh, you know, specific knowledge and so on and so forth. In some part of the fact that having done a uh, successful business over a period of time. But the fact happened to be we literally struggled for about three to four years with various consultants coming in and the various kind of a scenario. Because what was happening was tremendously theoretical. A lot of talk, a lot of this one, the practical application was missing, the actual business exposure and experience was not there. Till that time I said, you know, let's stop it. Because basically I joined her as far as because my business, you know, could put on an autopilot kind of scenario. And we got down to the business because we have complementary skills. She has a skill as far as the fashion is concerned about skills with regard to the marketing. And I think the last uh, one year or so, we, uh, you know, three times we have grown. Like suppose as far as the growth itself is concerned. So what I'm saying happens to me that so much of this one, you know, like suppose whenever you speak to, go to conferences, you speak to various teams, team that we talk about. But what's happening is as far as the team itself is concerned, you know, you tend to pull in different directions rather than a, a focused kind of a scenario and a lot of talk, a lot of theory, rather than a practical kind of a business, where you just get down doing a business is much easier than it. Thank you. Absolutely. Brilliant, sir. Very good. Great. So we move to the next ingredient now. Now this is something which is I fundamentally believe in, is having your own unique insight about the large market that we talked about, about the problem that we talked about, about the customer that we talked about, about the solution you are building. Basically, you must know something about that business, about that market, about that sales process, marketing, whatever else, about what works what doesn't work. That has to come from your own unique insight. Not something which Google can tell you, not something which Wikipedia will tell you, not something which an advisor will tell you, not something which your mentor will tell you, not something which a competition already knows about it. None of that. Unless you have figured out this very thing, Success is going to be only incidental, accidental. Accidental successes are by the very sweet. So I'm not putting it down. 
But we'll talk about ingredient. This is the key ingredient. This is something which only comes by talking to customer, being in the market, being on the field. Not sitting in front of computer and not into that experience. Even if you're building a technology product, still. Even if you're developing an app which is only going to talk, you know, take the only way for you and uh, between you and the customer is going to be that app, still. Only way it comes is by talking to customers, talking to people who are doing this business. And you know what? Most important part, you don't even have to be from that domain to have that unique insight. In fact, most of the time, people who succeed are people who come outside the domain. All the large new age businesses which have been built by people who don't come from that domain, who don't understand that domain. Because then, we are much more open to learning, open to exploring new ideas, open to questioning everything because since you don't know, you have no shame in saying, I don't know, please explain me. Why does it work this way? How does this work? These are questions that you have to answer. Why is this customer buying this? Why is this customer not buying it? Why is the customer buying it but not using it? What do I do for a customer to use this? Right? These are questions that has to come to you and that can only come by talking to customers, being with them, seeing your competing products, how do they use it. Talking to competition is not a great idea. It does not tell you anything. But talking to customers is a great idea. So this unique insight is always developed over a period of time. You may not have it the day you start. If you do, I would categorize you, label you as a visionary. Right? Take that with a as a Please. Yes. Most of the people who claim they wrote everything about it, possibly they don't know about it. Because this is something which comes over a period of time by experience. This does not come by sitting under the body tree. So what do you do? How do you really get that? As I said, I ruled out Google. I ruled out Wikipedia. Right? So what do you do? <coughs> Dirty your hands, take off your suit tie, go to the customer, sit under the team and say, sir, Please explain. I am a child, sir. I don't know what you have to say. How do you do it? How do you use it? How do you use it? How do you use it? These are things which tell you a lot and you develop your own unique insight. This insight is what is the secret. Your idea is not the secret you understand. This is what is your secret. But I tell you what, no big deal about actually going and selling, uh, sharing the secret as well. Because it is your unique insight, even if you go and tell the whole world, half the world will not even accept it or agree to it, which is fine. The world does not need to agree to everything that you say. But this is what tells you or gives you the conviction that the road that you are choosing is possibly the right road. I'll give you a small insight from my own experiences. So I sell HR software and I sell that to small and medium enterprises. Anyone who is an expert in HR here, come from HR background, yes ma'am. Please don't take insult what I'm going to say. We figured by talking to a lot of organizations, because we sell HR software. So the 
people who will buy HR software are the HR managers, right? And the store. We made our own mistakes. Now we stop selling to HR managers. We don't sell to HR managers. <coughs> we sell to line managers. Why? Because our insight was that HR is not HR manager's problem. The HR manager in your organization is just a facilitator. The actual problem is that of the sales manager, of the operations manager, of the factory manager. It is his problem. If people are unhappy, he has to answer. If people are leaving, he has to suffer. If a salesman does not perform, he has to answer to his boss as to why his targets are not met. His boss is not going to say that, oh, I understand one of your salesmen did not perform. He said, so what? You are the manager. Yeah. It's the manager's problem. It is never the HR manager's problem. What would the HR guy say? Right? HR manager will say, okay, you are performing fine. Hey? I'll find one other one. That's the solution which I have to have, right? Or, okay, there's a deficiency here. I can send it for training. That's what. What training you tell me, I will facilitate it. So HR manager's role or the facilitator's role. So if it is not HR manager's problem, how can the HR manager buy my solution? The so solution has to be bought by someone whose problem it is. How did I discover it? By sitting under body three. No. By trying to sell to HR managers and figuring out they don't get what I'm trying to say. And then in frustration, you go and bitch about the HR manager to the sales manager says, Oh my god, I think I need your service. And then the light bulb goes, Oh, why did he say so? Right? And then you probe and then you figure it out. This is how it works. So then from that time on, we said we don't sell to HR managers. If the inquiry comes in, we ensure very politely that we find out all of the stakeholders in that organization. Who are large teams, who would possibly be the right people that we should actually be pitching to, even if the inquiries come from HR. Right. That is a unique insight that we developed over a period of time. It didn't happen overnight. It happened after a repeated set of failures that we face in the market. Right? Anyone here that would want to share, if not their unique insight, if you think it is sacred, please keep that. Of how you went about discovering your unique insights. Please, speak. yes, sure. So, hi. Okay. Uh, so, I run a website called MedFinder. Uh, we are an online medicine ordering service, and uh, I don't come from a pharma background. I'm not a doctor, but Brilliant. I stumbled upon this problem because of certain reasons, and that's how I started off. Pivoted right okay. twice. Now there's a fine, or at least till now, a fine version. Uh, one unique thing that I did was once we started getting orders, I did the first 100 sales by myself. I did the entire like, order processing, uh, went to the customers, spoke to them that what made you order, how did you come to the website, what are the problems. And through the first 100 orders, I got to know a lot about the challenges in the operation, the challenges in the website, and then we developed, or at least we're developing the next version, which is going to be far superior than the original version. And had it been that I'd done the original, you know, the connects to A-B testing models and stuff, although you would have got insights, but they wouldn't have been that spectacular in terms of uh, the way now the processes are, the way operations are done. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Talking to your customer and being in touch, being on field uh, helps you a lot. Brilliant. Anyone else? Please. So, uh, when I started, and you there, just wait. So that your words of wisdom can actually be captured on camera as well. Yeah. So when, when I started, I knew the customer I wanted to serve, but I didn't know what problem I was trying to solve. So I was, you know, I, I was uh, you know, determined to serve bottom of the pyramid customers. And uh, not being one of the bottom of the pyramid, you know, coming from there, it was, it was going to be a challenge. So I went and took a walking tour of Dharavi. And, uh, you know, it was, it was one of the best things that I did in terms of getting insights over you know, what they do. I was surprised to see the fact that there were 50, almost half of them had Android phones, they were using WhatsApp and YouTube, not using Facebook and Twitter as much. Uh, and one of the insights I would like to share, because it's not something that I've taken on, but 
Um, I asked the tour guide, you know, why he's doing what he's doing, and he said that 99% of his customers were, you know, from outside the country, and he wanted to learn conversational English. So language, you know, the aspirational value of English turned out some, to be something that I learned, and then I went to the app store and I searched for, you know, uh, English, uh, you know, learning English for Hindi speaking population, and there were just two or three apps, and they had you know, between a million to five million downloads, and three paid apps uh, with a very, very terrible user experience. And you know, so that, that kind of made me realize that, you know, it's uh, no one would tell you that this is the app that would have five million downloads. So, what are you into? So, uh, I'm, I'm doing something not related to this insight, but it's a broadcast messaging app. Uh, it's called Broadcast. So, it serves people who want to send messages to, to a large audience uh, and uh, it's targeting spiritual gurus, politicians, uh, you know, small time celebrities. So he's the one who would monetize from people who have been monetizing from us so far. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, he was, he was saying something. Uh, we started sometime last year, uh, and you know, we again stumbled upon a problem. We started as a typical recruitment agency, and uh, I also, like you know, ended up meeting the CEOs instead of the HR managers because HR managers didn't entertain us. We had, you know, they said we have people who will hire for us, and we stumbled upon a big problem that you know, the biggest problem that people were facing was not that their inability of HR people to get them the right people. So uh, we changed our solution. Instead of you know just sending the candidates, we started getting them trained and skilled teams. And uh, in the same insight, you know we also got, got lucky enough to be in time with two startups. So we realized like us, they don't have money, but they have ambitious, uh, they have very great ideas, but they want teams from you know ex IITs to build products for them, which of course is not possible. So we started renting out teams to them. So instead of them to hire uh, you know uh, a team of of their own, which would have costed a bombshell of amount for them. We started, you know, building teams for them. So, you know, for example, you know, for something as simple as development of their own product, they just need members for initial six months. So, we started renting out to them. So, that's a problem we discovered, you know, instead of going to HR managers who would just make us wait endlessly, we thought, let's talk to the CEOs and they would give us direct access to skilled people. Right. Ma'am, you are not going to hate us, right? No. Please don't. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, anyone else who want to share, how do you get yeah, this? My startup is about venue bookings for event. So initially, for, for venue booking for event, so there are weddings or birthday parties or anniversaries or birthday parties. So initially, when I started out, people told me that, that most of the people are aware of if they are looking at there is a wedding venue, so there is no need for such a portal. But when I inquired more, with the people who recently had an event in their family. Then I realized that most of the people are aware of only two to three venues in and around their locality. And the chances are high that those are low because there is something like I know as auspicious in India. And everyone wants to get married on that date itself. <laughs> <laughs> then the problem comes that people want to know more choices. They want to they want more options. And then like then they don't have much information about other venues. So then it comes into picture. Thank you. Brilliant. So you are here. Yeah, so we are basically into we are basically IT firms. So what we do is like we will we provide a very scalable and flexible infrastructure for enterprises to come and build their application systems, etc. Uh, so one of our major term, one of our major uh, services is data processing. So we do high speed data processing. So you have this uh, track. So companies basically they use a lot of, they use a lot of data to get insights into their customers, their organization, etc. So one of the major uh, there's a there's a very uh, specific term for this major challenge in the data processing field that's called as polyglot persistence. Okay, so what does what that says is that you need different kinds of systems to handle different kinds of data. Okay, so what our company basically doing is we're trying to eradicate that that line. So what we thought since we're an IT company, we thought we'd approach the CTOs of these companies and we'll tell them, okay boss, uh, you can use a service, it's just a very simple tool to use. You can manage all kinds of data uh, companies are getting in one platform itself. So what we saw is the CTOs were pretty much the interested, they would uh, listen to the presentation, etc. But later on they would not turn up, there was no response coming back from them. So 
we are like a bit of we are a bit spellbound. It's like saying, hey, what, why is this happening? So these are technical guys. They should be happy about this product. So what we realized is that the, what the CTO used to do, the CTO's main job was like they need to product, they need to uh, find different solutions for different kinds of for this different kinds of processing, all the different kind of data, like social media data, etc. So what happened was that if supposedly if I came with a solution which is a one to one fit all solution. A CTO doesn't have the model the main challenge is that a CTO does a CTO's work is reducible. It gets reduced. And first of all is that a CTOs have already deployed this kind of solution to the enterprise. So tomorrow the CEO comes and says, it's like your job is basically to ease my technical uh, my technical uh, thing, my technical spend and my technical what are we But why do you go for some some solution like us? <coughs> That's something that we found the CTO. The CTO is not actually, the technical person not actually the right person to sell you. So what you did is that you went to the management instead. You said to the management that, well, they do one thing, you can let us handle the data for you. We do the entire data management processing for you. It's our responsibility. We take care of it. You don't have any challenges. We, we, we guarantee the entire cost reduction and your uh, life cycle, your your system of time, etc. So that is something we is something which I connected to which example to Brilliant. So let me give you one insight which I have sold to corporates quite a lot in my life, which I'm sure accounts for at least fifty percent of the which I have. So let me give you one insight. It will not be of use unless you actually practice it yourself, but let me tell you anyway. Whenever you sell to a corporate, please understand. Anything that you sell to corporate, tell them how the organization is going to benefit is great. How is that individual going to benefit? And I'm not talking about under the table. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about bribing the person. No. How does that individual benefit? Are you meeting his KIA? Are you helping him look better in his team? Are you helping him grow his team rather than cutting down his team? Everyone wants to large empire to be if you are going to say, hey, you know what? I will cut down your team size in half. How? <coughs> Go right now. I don't want to see you. Right? That's a typical attitude. So, why the benefit of organization is great? What is the benefit to the individual? Will he get increment, better increment next year? Will he get promoted next year? Show him away. You are not going to bought. We think when you go and sell to B2B, we think you are selling to an organization. No. Sorry, but individual within the top manage. Please. My startup is in the field of rooftop solar. And uh, one thing that you realize is that uh, some of the uh, companies that actually need cheaper solar power don't necessarily have facilities managers. But when you go to larger companies and you speak to a facilities manager, he his KIA is to reduce the power cost. But the decision making authority is is so lala driven that it is different from the guy. So that is a challenge that you face. Uh, if, if you go to a larger company, it's hard to access the top management. If you go to a smaller company, that particular role may not exist. But you're absolutely right. I think what is in it for the individual on a clean basis is far more powerful uh, than, than uh, trying to uh, sell a story about rooftop solar. Everybody knows that it's the future, but nobody wants to put money into it. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, great. So we'll use it. Hi friends, we are into uh, interior, basically organizing unorganized, unorganized market. So I have a, my own experience that while doing interiors for others. We started an idea of helping people like corporates. So my client is now housing.com. I'll just share this example. Housing is a really interesting word these days, right? <laughs> 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 it's painting the town pink. Sir, example is that when we were pitching for housing.com, there is an end user, or an administration who is handling the record. We had given them the concept that if you have a full 50,000 square feet of your electrical cost, then your cost will be reduced and the management will also be happy, which will definitely help you in your promotions also. Which will definitely help you in your promotions also. This is how we entered into housing.com and opportunity we have and we are serving them. Awesome. A lot of money to be made. Okay. So, if you look at it, you know, your own experiences, 
just follow the same fact that every one of you, or at least most of you, whoever it is said, I'm sure about you, right? That you've managed to find your own unique insight. And I can tell you for sure that if you had Googled, read all the research, PR articles, none of this would be written in any of those articles, right? Because if it was written in articles, believe me, by now there would be businesses running around that would know nothing be unique about this. It would be well known, right? So any insight which is well known insight is not a great insight, is not a great reason for you to actually build a business around. You have to build a business around an insight which is your own unique insight. Moving on. Differentiator. Again, much of the news world, everyone says, hey, what's your USP? Uh, you know, you are taught about you know, defining a differentiator, all of it. But what really is a differentiator? Why do we need to have a differentiator? I mean, if Flipkart is e-commerce, why can't I have another e-commerce? I mean, Flipkart does not have 100% of the market share, right? Right? Of the retail market share. Of the entire retail market share, they're possibly still less than 10%. There's still a whole lot of work which is happening. Why can't you just build another flip card? Why not? If they have only 10% of the market, I can go and target the rest 90% of the market. Isn't it? But obviously that does not work. Why does it not work? Because for any product or service, there is a initial set of customers who are called early adopters, right? If I go to market today with a Flipkart 2, right, the guy is going to, the first person that I will have to approach is the same set of early adopters who are shopping on Flipkart. And the first question they are going to ask me, why you? Why not? Whatever the reason for trust, leave that aside. Not getting into that discussion, but which is why you need differentiator. Right? So I read a brilliant article. I'm sure a whole lot of you have heard about the site called shopclues.com, right? How many of you have shopped at shopclues.com? Only one. And they're not going bad. That's a story of a differentiator and also a unique insight. And I'll share that story. Shopkins.com <coughs> doesn't. Have you seen any coding around of Shopkins.com? You've never seen any coding, right? They're still doing well, they're raising money, doing good. If you go to their site, you will find products which you possibly don't even know of, brands which you don't even know of. And you say, yeah, second grade site. They have few larger brands, but otherwise, in general, if you compare with all of the other players, or all of the e-commerce players. So they sell to tier two and tier three farms. And the products which are sold are regional brands. So a brand which is very popular in say Tamil Nadu will actually you will find them on shop shopclues.com. Who's sitting here, you won't have even heard of that brand. But people who are buying there, they can relate to that brand, they trust that brand, which is why they'll go and buy it from shop. So they built their entire business around this unique insight that the early adopters of tier one cities are saturated with trip cards, and bombs, the Amazon, all of that. <coughs> So they built the business <coughs> around products which will appeal to tier two and tier three towns and cities of India. Which is why you have not heard of it, you have not bought from it, but it's still too well. So their differentiator was set of products which will appeal to that target segment.
the differentiator was both product and target segment. <coughs> Many times, you may come up with a product which is differentiated product for the same segment, undifferentiated product for the different segment. So I may have exactly the same product for a different segment of market that I am selling. Right. Any of this could be a differentiator, but you must have a differentiator. But what really is a differentiator? The best way to know the differentiator is to know what is not a differentiator. So what is not a differentiator is a cheaper product. No one wants to buy a cheap product. No one wants to buy a cheap cell phone. They want to buy a nice cell phone which fits into their budget. Something which they will carry with pride. No one wants to drive a cheap <coughs> car. Everyone knows about that, right? No one wants to fly a cheap airline. You know what I expect. So cheap doesn't sell. A faster car no one wants to buy. You want to buy a Ferrari, not a faster car. So what is not a differentiator? If you have to describe your product, say, how are you different from X product? And if you say, it is cheaper, it is better, it is faster, that's not a differentiator. Because all of these are subjective. In my mind, whose mind? In customer's mind. You may think it is better, but your definition of better is possibly very different from customer's uh, definition of better. Hence, when we say my product is better, is a absolutely bullshit differentiator to have. Because the customer does not understand what is better. The customer understands what does he get out of it, which he is not getting out right now. That's a differentiator. Can you give him something which he couldn't have be, been able to afford earlier? He wants to buy that. He doesn't want to buy a cheaper product. He wants to buy the same product which you are buying, which fits into this cost. How do you do that? Is you want to figure it out. So, you don't want a cheaper product. You don't want a faster product. What do you do with that fast? I want a PC or a laptop on which I can play games. I don't want a faster laptop. What do you do with a fast laptop? <coughs> which is why you get a games laptop. What is the games laptop ultimately? It's a faster laptop with the games uh, adapter, board, extra, whatever else. Right? So you see the difference? Cheap is not a benefit that you're giving to the person. The benefit that you're giving is you're giving him an aspirational product which fits into her budget. It's not cheap. Right? You're giving a product which delivers more than what the person is getting right now. That's better for the person. It's not better. What exactly you give me different is a additional is a better. What do I get if it runs fast? If it has better, <coughs> faster chip in my mobile phone, what does it do for me? You can watch video, you can play games, <coughs> right? That's the benefit. A better experience is not a differentiator. Because again, better experience is subjective. This is a games phone, you can play games on this, you can watch video on this. Because you can't watch it on the other phone. Right? So that's a differentiator. Phone A, you can't watch video. Phone B, you can. Phone A, you can't play games or it's just very slow. Phone B, you can play games smooth. Right? The person can relate to what is different. Again, coming back to the first topic that we discussed. 
if you identify how a person is underserved, so you identify this is what the person is getting so far, this is what you're getting, the difference, the delta is your differentiator. So if you understand you are getting into an underserved market, and if you understand how and why a person is underserved, then you understand what your differentiator is. Coming back to most important part, a differentiator is not a feature of your product. You can't say I have these three extra features in my product. What do you get by those features in the differentiator? So underserved, going back to that mobile phone on which you can play games, you are using a mobile phone on which you can't play games, here's a mobile phone you can play games on. On a laptop you can't play game very well, the graphics is not clear, here's a laptop which has got a special graphics card. If I say it has got a special graphics card, what do I understand of that? Nothing, I am not a game. But if you tell him that, oh you know what, you can play this particular game, he will understand. That's the delta, that's the differentiator. That was the underserved part, the person couldn't play certain games, which he could have. Now this new laptop, the person can. That's what the differentiator is. So what is important for success is not just finding what the differentiator in the market is, but capability to build that differentiator and maintain that differentiation over a period of time because every differentiation has a shelf life. Believe me, you bring that differentiation six months down the line, there will be ten other guys who have exactly the, or at least you can claim you have exactly the same differentiator that you had. So, that brings to sustainable differentiator part. How do you sustain your differentiation? Because having a differentiation to start with is a great idea but not being able to sustain is a foolish idea because it's like I learned everything and I come in, I give you the entire gyan and you go and build business on the gyan which I could build business on. Isn't that stupid? It is. So you have driven inside, you figured out what was the underserved market, you created a product but you can sustain it. Someone else will go take that and build a better business. So you would have heard about this concept called a second mover advantage. So while everyone knows about first mover advantage, the second mover advantage, the second mover guy, he learns a lot from the mistakes and the learnings of the first mover and he builds better product, faster go to market, more money in the bank, better ability to sell and you know displaces the first mover guy. Why? Because the differentiator was not sustainable. So how do you sustain that differentiation over a period of time? That is the key, right? Anyone who want to talk about differentiator for their own businesses? <coughs> In the terms that I, so you are not allowed to use these terminology that I give better, right? Mine is faster, mine is cheaper. If you don't have to use it, how do you say that you are different? Please, sir. I have a question actually. Yeah, sure, please. Ask. So, based on what you just said, what will be flip class differentiator? Based on what you said. At this point in time or when they started? At this point of time, now that there's an Amazon, there's everyone out there, what is flip class differentiator? The only differentiator which they can claim at this point in time. There is a customer service. So a better customer service or a faster no. customer service? No, it's a predictable <coughs> customer service. So you can't say that I have a better customer service. You can only say I have a predictable customer service. That if you send a complaint, you would get a refund. Right? 
That's a customer service. It's predictable. I don't have to haggle and prove it to you why this didn't work, right? That's a customer service. If I order and I get it before the date that you said you will get it, it's a better customer service. But I, it's not a better, I can't say I have a better customer service. <coughs> you will say on time, before time delivery, that's a better customer service. So you would, Flipkart would never go and say that I have a better customer service. Have you ever heard them saying that? You have not. Because better is a relative word, it's not an absolute word. But when you say I will deliver before the time that I promised, it's a measurable, it's a differentiator which you can measure and say, okay, the other guys will delay, I will delay. They are not saying other guys will delay. It's your experience which will say, so tomorrow if everyone starts delivering the same way, they will have to find something else which differentiates that. Is it sustainable? So is Flipkart's uh, differentiator uh, proposition is sustainable? Which is why I said no differentiator will be sustainable in perpetuity unless you have a patent to that. Is patent also sustainable in India? <laughs> That's the question of the Right? So, anyone else who want to talk about... Yeah, can you have to... I have also questions. Sure, please. So, there are companies like Take My Trip, Yatra.com, Clear Trip. So, so, all these three are very successful websites. But the thing is that when a person goes on the website, more or less they are offering the same service. With the same differentiation point which are either being copied or in the process of being copied. So people look at those companies are like very successful companies. But still it is very difficult to point out sustainable differentiation. So is it only like a brilliant point? Like brilliant how it is? I, I will answer that, but would anyone else want to take a stab at this question? Brilliant point, but this is something which most of you have to face over a period of time. When you become what is called mainstream businesses, when you have multiple people offering similar product services, possibly similar price point because you can't even control a price point, right? Very good question. Would anyone want to take a stab at this question? Stickiness of the customer that once you are on board, most likely... No, we talk about from a customer perspective. Why does a first customer choose a Make My Trip over, say, a Clear Trip or a Yatra? Is it Right? So one person says experience of Clear Trip is much better. I would, I would also believe that because I invariably, blindly go to Clear Trip and buy. Right? I won't even compare that. But I like Clear Trip, clean, simple user interfaces. Right? How many people like Make My Trip here or go to Make My Trip here? Please say why you will go to Make My Trip. You will possibly have an answer. Yes, sir. Because I find it very user friendly kind of thing. See? So now you see, I believe Clear Trip is user friendly. He believes Make My Trip is user friendly. So user friendly itself is not a differentiator, it's a relative term. Right? So Make My Trip has its own set of customer. Do you think Make My Trip will succeed if they change their user interface to match with Clear Trip? They would fail. No. Right? They would fail. For simple reason because he has Make My Trip has got customer like him which likes Make My Trip experience of buying a ticket there. You do not like Make My Trip. Doesn't matter. But someone likes it. Make My Trip knows what does he like, which is why they have built a product like that. So when you get to a commoditized market, it's a commodity, right? It's <coughs> as good as Alu Piyash today. Buying a flight ticket is a Alu Piyash, it's a commodity. So when you go to a commoditized market, right, the differentiator is very clearly targeted to a set of customers that you are talking to. Could I just ask for a parallel of that, not in a user experience online model, but sure. brick and mortar? Give sure. you an example. Sure. Uh, within my sector, uh, uh, solar, there are about 600 people in India who put solar rooftops on your, you know, if you... Now the question is, how do you differentiate? Everyone answers these. And that is the reason I don't want to do it. But my question to you is, apart from some significant geographical advantage, 
right? Or any previous recommendation. I don't see anything else. Can you please throw some insight on that? That the the, the okay. So differentiating the brick and mortar business, but which is of let 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 let's take a differentiation of brick and mortar business. I don't understand the solar industry. I don't have a unique insight, which is why you need to develop a unique insight. But I still take a make an attempt to that. Sure. Right? What I understand, one of the bigger problems is solar, and this is with my experience of solar panel being in installed on the rooftop of the building which I live in, right? It does not work flawlessly all the time. Service is a big issue. What would be a differentiator? A guy who would come and then want the person to come. According to me, that would be the biggest differentiator for a guy who provides a solar panel. Because half the places solar panels don't work. They are a vanity. Most of the time, you don't even know that sort of working, right? Because you, it's a supplementary source of energy, right? It's not a main source of energy. So if it is down, you won't even know that it is down unless you know you have someone who measures it. Now I live in a residential apartment. Do not measure that. The guy who measures it is my watchman, right? Is he an expert on that? He is not. Only thing he says, sir, ask for me, What do you do? You don't even know why. Why is it going on? The only thing that you can do is to have a guy who will come and check it. It could be my problem. Maybe I have to keep switch off. <laughs> right? But how do I know? So something like this, I would think, a service is a huge, hugely important part. So after sales service in the brick and mortar industry is non-existent in India. Like after they leave. So I, I agree with that. I know someone who runs a. Uh, waste management plant, right? One of the time members not here. He runs a waste management uh, plant, and his biggest differentiator is exactly that: that when it breaks down, his guy will be there in three hours time flat to fix it. He figured that was a differentiator. So I am talking from my own experience of having a solar panel. But as I said, I'm not an expert. I don't know. But if you go and talk to customers who are using solar panel, right? Why they choose one over another, and what are the problems they're facing after that, would possibly tell you what the differentiator is. However, what I would want to point out is extremely, extremely important. Is that differentiator has to be something which a person would understand before she buys a product, not after. So if customer service is a differentiator in your business, it has to go pre-sales. Because unless I have used a solar panel, and unless I have had bad experience, I won't even know that. Typically, when you install solar panel, it will break down, and the guy is not going to turn off. Right? So differentiator is always a message. A person understands before she buys the product, before she decides at the time of deciding which product to buy. That is the differentiator. Question. So, uh, can we uh, compare the solar panel with the bigger brand? And can I say, okay, I want to give an Uber experience? In my industry, you can. Uh, it works for some point in time. Uh, stops working after that. And tying to a big brand also is that if that big brand fails, uh, you also you know take the blame for that. Not the blame, but uh, basically you know people will make fun of that. Oh, you are over of that. Just in case Uber fails, right? It it does sometimes. So uh, it's very important to give people. Uh, Reference point. So they don't say it now, but our restaurants, which used to open earlier, they used to say it's a five-star quality because the concept of restaurants were different, which were outside the larger hotels and the ones which were inside the larger hotels. So by saying I'm a five-star quality, you are not saying you maintain those standards, but you're saying my experience will be similar to the experience which. You have when you go to a restaurant in a five-star hotel, right? 
So that is how you associate people. So yes, it is. As long as we convey, so what you're trying to basically convey is that I give you standardized service. Right? What is the Uber experience? You press a button, it comes, right? And you get a standardized experience, <coughs> standardized service, right? That's Uber experience. So by saying that, you have to ensure that it builds that. By saying, which means press a button, the guy will be there. But if you press a button and the guy is going to call and say, okay, how many people are coming? That's not Uber experience. <coughs> right? Just a standardized experience. So if you could say, whichever is the best salon all over the world and say, okay, you get that experience at your home, right? Possibly people will be able to relate to that. So you have to ensure that your messaging conveys the differentiator before the person buys the product. It has to be something which sticks in the mind. Product market fit. What is the product market fit? It's nothing but whatever we have talked about so far. Trying to figure out which product is going to work for which market. You do that by iterating over a period of time. So, uh, by iterating quickly over a period of time, trying to figure out which product, because your product has multiple use cases, so which particular use case of that product, and because your product could be sold to multiple different sets of target customers, which is that one initial set of target customers that your product will work the best. That's understanding the product market fit. Now again, you do not, while you may have a capability to deliver 10 things, focus on that one use case for which the person would buy. You don't have to deliver that use case over a period of time, but that's your entry strategy into that market. Why would a person buy? Because of this one use case, and that is a broken use case, and that is what they have understood is an underserved market. And hence, we want to talk about that one thing. And who do you talk to? That set of people who are going to appreciate your message, who are going to appreciate this particular use case. Now, this is much, much easier said than done. If you figure out one shot, go and buy a lottery ticket, possibly you will win the lottery that day. It hardly works in one shot. It evolves over a period of time. It works by talking to customers, not doing surveys by the way, by talking to customers, which is different from doing surveys, customer interviews. And iterating over it multiple times without being attached to your manager, I say, should we get the age of not check it out? Should we create the player? Be a good friend, so much money on that. And if you move up, that's not your company, you go back to the other. Many of us say this in frustration, right? That I've built such a beautiful product, and why did I not understand what I'm trying to sell to him? He won't. He just wants you to understand what he wants to buy, right? And this happens over a period of time. And this happens with multiple iterations. And with these iterations, you get that unique insight. That unique insight leads you to differentiator that you build in the product. That differentiator leads you to this use case for this particular customer. That when you go to the customer and the customer says, aha, I want this. Right? Then you achieve the product market fit. Because you know 
Who is your customer? What is she going to buy? What message that you give that the person understands that this is the product for me? If you've done these three things, you will achieve these three things, you have understood these three things, you will achieve the product market fit. Take a person 
in get his interest and say yes, this is something which I need, is your marketing, right? And how scalable is that marketing? When I say scalability, if I spend X amount of money to reach 100 people, do I have to spend 10x amount of money to reach 1000 people? It's not scalable, right? So if I do X amount of money to reach 100 people, and if I spend 5, 5x to reach 10x people, there's some scalability in that, right? So that is what is about medium. Which medium works best? And this medium will change over a period of time. So today if you start with one particular medium to reach first 100 set of people, next how will possibly need a different set of, uh, different medium, right? And at some point in time you possibly need to talk paint on paint or you need to go and uh, do a TV spot, that's fine. Because the first 100,000 people you wanted to reach, you have figured out a way to reach. But the next million people, you can't reach the same way, so you possibly have to do a different medium. So at different point in time, the medium will change. But what is most important is the initial medium, which was best for you, because that is the time when you're strapped for cash. Right? So which is the best medium which reaches the maximum number of people that you want to reach in the first iteration. Right. So we have already discussed this part, that people buy a message, not a product. They buy the product later, they buy the message first. So understanding what sells and understanding which medium sells is extremely important. I'll move to the next one quickly. If your product requires one-on-one -on -one sales pitch, one-on-one -on -one does not necessarily mean one-on-one, -on -one, right? But basically it requires some kind of interaction before the person will buy. <coughs> is there an intervention which is needed before a person would buy? Right? So this is extremely important. First and foremost, you have to be shameless. Sales is a brutal job, right? How many of you are shameless sales guys? Very few. Please become shameless sales people. <coughs> if you are not, ensure that you have a co-founder who is a shameless sales guy. Yeah, so you are important, right? Because it's a brutal job, if you go with a new concept to anyone, people would doubt, you could be fraud, it is too good to be true, right? You don't look the guy who can sell something like this, oh you are a small company, whole lot of those things come in. I've never heard about you, who are you, no one told me about this earlier, I've never seen your ad, whatever else, those kind of things which come in. You can't fight that. You have to work within that as a constraint which you have. Right? Which means the only way to sell is to just keep going after it, keep fine tuning the pitch. So if you say that the customer is an idiot, he does not understand what you're trying to say, you are an idiot, you are not understanding what customer is trying to say. He's telling you that your pitch does not work. Please change your pitch. Most important part, again here, is like we talked about product, and we talked about iterating the message itself. Similarly, the sales pitch sells. So you mentioned sort of about selling first hundred medicine yourself, right? You have heard about that millionary tale of how Yuba and Bani used to carry clothes on his cycle and go and sell, right? You heard about how Bansal used to go and deliver, wrap the books and deliver themselves, right? It's not because you don't have money, of course you don't have money which is why you do it, but because that's the best way to understand what sells. That's the best way to understand what customer likes, what customer does not like, what customer understands, what customer does not understand. It's just fine tuning your sales pitch. First hundred sales, if you are a push product where you have to go and make a pitch, you have to make a sale, has to come from one of the co-founders. You cannot hire someone to and sell for you. So there is a concept called coin-operated salesman. 
right? That coin operator says when you put in money, you put in one coin, you press a button, and the person group should be able to sell. That happens, you know, after possibly you have fine-tuned, you have learned. That is the customer of X profile, X pitch has to go, the person Y profile, Y pitch has to go. Right? How do you know that? You don't know in your day one. You know that as you go along, as you progress. Right? And the last most important part of sales process is understanding the scalability of sales process. If I take X amount to sell to X guy, if I need to spend 10x amount to sell to 10x people, not scalable. You have to figure it out over a period of time, how do you improve the sales cycle? How do you decrease the time that it takes to sell? How do you decrease that in one pitch you can possibly sell a larger volume? How do you do that? Then it is scalable, otherwise it is not. Because then you will always be limited by the number of people, sales people that you can employ. Again, scalability is efficient. Remember we talked about building large businesses. And as it says, liquids call ABC, always be closing. Whoever you meet to, wherever you talk about, think about closing a sale. Doesn't matter, you will not be able to close it, but doesn't matter. The guy will still go back with the message. Sorry. Most important part, Everyone said you have to persevere with your idea, you, have to, you know, you can't give up. Great. I'm not saying that. Of course you have to persevere with your idea. It's not going to work out on day one. But you also must know at what point in time you give up. There's an opportunity cost associated with the time that you're putting in building this business. You have to look at it whether you could be doing something else in that time which could give better value. So how do you decide when to persevere and when to give up? My personal philosophy set a benchmark that if we are able to reach this scale in 12 month time, I would continue else I would not. Or I would look at a different option. If I am able to reach this revenue, this volume, this product, this market, whatever else. So what happens is that when you have set a benchmark right in the beginning, and don't bother about whether that benchmark is right or wrong. There's nothing right or wrong about it. You may go and revise that benchmark. You may feel that, okay, it doesn't matter. I think I'm willing to give it another year. That's fine. But at least you know to get down the line that I've been chasing the same goal for two years and nothing is moving. There's something wrong seriously. Either you want to change the path or you change the goal. Path being same, goal, goal being same, and you're not reaching, there's a problem. So it's extremely important to figure it out a difference between persevering and being foolish about it. Many times we are so attached to what we are trying, trying to do that we don't want to accept that this will not work. I'm not saying accept that it will not work just because the world is saying so. Put a benchmark, review and figure it out. It's not working, I give it a good shot, I don't think I can do anything different, anything better. Let's move on, figure out something else. And that's what I talk about, realistic perseverance. So Sanjay, are B2B businesses more difficult to scale uh, the sales process? B2B businesses are difficult to scale the sales process, which is why you need to understand how will the sales process evolve in terms of scalability. Even, even from the point of view of Divinga, yeah. uh, B2B customers are usually very nice. And they won't say it straight to you that your product you know, is something I won't like. Yeah. They appreciate it, they say nice things and they never call back. Yeah. So you don't know whether your product is bad or, or they are... Which is why you, know, you got to put a benchmark and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, hoping against hope is not a great idea. Mm -hmm. right. But then you're talking about the supposed to talk about business plan, right? We talk about everything else except the <coughs> business plan. So what happens to the business plan? Right? So whatever we talked about, put down on paper, that's your business plan. Forget the PPT, forget the Excel, right? That's all formatting the business plan. That's not the business plan. So don't go and look it for a business plan format. It's not going to help you. 
Don't go look out for a business plan builder. Nothing will help you. What we talked about, if you wrote down on paper, went through it 100 times, right? Then you can put it to any format that anyone wants you to. Right? So that's all about business plan. <coughs> Just ensure that anything that you write, nothing is written in stone. All businesses which succeed, most of them succeed with things which they are doing differently today than what they started off with. It only means that they have kept evolving over a period of time to figure out what is going to succeed really. Right? So keep reviewing.